Welcome back everyone, live CUBE coverage here in Chicago. We're here for KubeCon, Cloud Native Con, part of the CNCF. We've never missed a KubeCon, we've been there from the beginning. The CUBE has been there documenting front row seat to all the action being on the, in the arena as well as front row. I'm John Furrier, your host. Rob Streche is here with me. Savannah Peterson's been on the Cube. Joe Peterson tomorrow will be here. Uh, Rob, great to see you. We wind down day two. We've got a great special guest, Joel Inman. is the CEO of Compute.ai. Uh, Cube alumni also participated in our Super Cloud 4 event recently in Palo Alto. Joel, great to see you again. Great to see you. We got SuperCloud 5 coming up. We, normally we don't have them this close together, but because of the uh, Amazon's uh, Web Services annual user conference, we're doing a special edition and coming off the heels of KubeCon, uh, Microsoft Ignite, OpenAI Developer Day. Yesterday was a huge success. Um, the a Amazon show is going to be the battle for AI supremacy. It's all the conversation everyone's talking about is AI. Um, and you're smiling because I know why, because you guys have a product coming out and it's out being developed. Um, Compute.ai is your company name, it's also your URL, it speaks for itself. We love more compute. It should be oxygen, as Vikram said on theCUBE, SuperCloud 4. Um, but here, here at KubeCon, this is the audience that actually gets into the, that's into like hardware and infrastructure to build platform engineering environments. A sweet spot for you guys, actually. Yeah. Uh, that's yeah. a long-winded intro, but welcome <laughs> to theCUBE. <laughs> yeah, thank you for having me, and I, and I love talking to you guys because it's a continuing conversation. You guys are evolving your thoughts, you're doing research, you're putting out different thought pieces, and I feel like we were able to join in and just kind of come right along with yeah. you. Uh, in terms of kind of what we do and, and where we're focused, we're building the, the compute engine for AI. It's all in the name, right? And the way we see the world is that yeah. AI ML is going to drive the future of compute, compute needs. It's going to be machine generated SQL and it's going to require a scale that we've never seen before. So we're yeah. implementing efficiencies within that compute layer to be able to handle that demand. And this is a great topic we're going to unpack here. Um, but before we do that, I just want to uh, mention to the folks you guys are a startup, um, self-funded, some angel. Not, not entirely self-funded. But pretty much not the traditional VC-backed uh, company. Uh, it's a tough market right now. What's it like being an early stage startup right now? Because you got, um, it's a buyer's market on the venture side, but it's a huge enablement on the AI side. You get a huge wave coming. What's it like? You know, I think there's, um, there's good conditions, there's bad conditions, but sometimes, you know, when you have a, a strong product a strong team and a strong vision, those are the factors that really transcend market conditions. And finding the right capital, visionary capital, that, com that kind of pairs with your vision is, is essential. So it is a lot like matchmaking, okay? But you know, funding is just the lowest common denominator. Everybody needs money, but who are you going to partner with? Who's going to take you to the next level? Who really understands your vision is going to introduce you to the right people within their network? Who's going to help inform your team and, and grow your team and really be right alongside with you as you grow? And you know, that's what, that's what we're looking for in investors. What are the opportunities for entrepreneurs out there that want to go get VC, venture capital? Because you don't really need that much to get in the game now, but to scale, you probably will probably have to do an institutional round of financing uh, through a venture capital, although again, and lots changing in that market, but still, you need capital to grow. What's the opportunities out there for entrepreneurs? Well, I think the opportunities are to have confidence in your vision and just to continue to press, who do you know, who do you know, who do you know, introduce me to find the right people that are going to back you. All right, let's unpack the compute, because you mentioned something earlier, I heard you uh, before we came on camera talking to another entrepreneur uh, and influencers here around how you see the next chapter after our current one we're in. Because we're in this euphoric moment of ChatGPT, OpenAI just had their dev development day, you're starting to see that grosser. And by the way, they're lowering costs, opening up the context windows. Um, so you're starting to see that progress. What's next? After we get through this first wave of AI, uh, what's next and where do you see the compute being the key there? Yeah, great question. So, um, love all the attention that AI is getting through ChatGPT and LLMs, right? I mean, the cool things you can do with it. You can cheat on your high school essays, right? You can you know, manufacture marketing, uh, marketing terms out of thin air. Uh, there's a whole world beyond generative AI. And when you're looking at the AI implementation of the future, enterprise A is going to come with 
all sorts of different models. And it's sort of like, you're hearing a lot of people say, I was there when, I was there before chat DPT. <laughs> because the reality is we have a community of data scientists that have been working on this for over a decade. They've been training their models and training their models and training their models. If you look at the Databricks survey from the summer, one in three models are now being operationalized, okay? So the way we view it is that it's time to move from training your models into production of your models, into implementing those use cases. And uh, you know, generative AI can't uh, be applied to certain workloads. So I'm thinking of credit card uh, fraud detection right now. When you have that generative aspect of AI, that's kind of licensed for the AI to come up with some hallucinations, <laughs> which you cannot absolutely have. So it's more like an inferential AI. So the bottom line is, you know, as AI starts to infiltrate our various infrastructure, that's the second wave. That's where Enterprise A is going to really come out. And where strong. do you see the unlimited compute opportunity? Because that's kind of your, your narrative right now is to talk about this idea of unlimited compute, like oxygen, it's going to be plentiful you know, uh, for the problem set, which is data. Yes. What do you, where do you see that fitting in? Yeah, what I problem agree. are you going to solve? So, the way that everybody is thinking about compute right now is AI is incredibly compute hungry, we know that, right? We're buying as many GPUs as we possibly can. They're flying off the shelves, we're even having to rent them. There are startups that are taking GPUs and they're renting them by the minute and by the second, right? But um, as you move into the, the, the fabric of our infrastructure, you're really going to see GPUs and CPUs working together. And they're going to work together in a common, a common SQL environment. So you have our data platforms, you have uh, Spark, Presto, Trino, they all can invoke models using UDFs that can all kind of connect right to that AI. You have big query, you can go right from your trained model into a production model. When you're having production, you need SQL and you need to, you need to be able to operationalize that model at, at cloud scale. So is that how you see really compute and data coming together or how, how is it that, because there's a lot of people taking different approaches to the platform be it from a storage up perspective, be it from, like you said, a, a data warehouse, data lake down perspective, and then the apps, the data apps are being built on top of those different data platforms, and AI being a data app, as far as I can, you know, can be a, not a data product, but data, more a data app, where you're, it's using multiple data products to go, maybe I have one for the CFO's office, and maybe I have one for HR, and we call them SLMs or segmented or specific language models for those. Is that how you're seeing this kind of more than one data platform for the right type of AI? Is that where you're seeing it? Um, when, you think the, when you think about the platform required for AI, so I kind of touched on it but I didn't complete the sentence, so yeah. let me complete the sentence. You need uh, GPUs and CPUs working together. You need to feed that AIML model, you need to feed it structured data, you need to feed it unstructured and semi-structured data. So you're going to have, you're going to have uh, vector databases, you're going to have relational databases, you're going to have GPUs, you're going to have CPUs, and providing the compute infrastructure for that is going to require a SQL-based framework that is able to scale. Um, the output in the back end of many of these AIM models is machine-generated SQL. So we're seeing these use cases in business intelligence where it's spitting out complex SQL automatically. And then it's going a layer deeper, you're infusing AI into those BI tools that's going to generate thousand times more SQL in the future. That complexity of that SQL requires compute efficiency and that's where we come in. So we're providing that compute efficiency to scale in a platform that hosts AI ML models, vector databases, relational databases together. Where do you see the integration happening? Because one of the things that we're also seeing is the large language models will have all this training built in. Why not use it there? Integrate that into my data infrastructure which might have proprietary data or no zero tolerance for hallucinations or any potential miscue. So this idea that you got to blend them together is a big topic and people are looking, what's your vision on that, how you see that playing out? Because this world's going to be dealing with a lot of data, machine generated data, whether it's SQL or other stuff, you're going to see dynamic things happen. You know, I think it's a broad question. I think the, uh, you, you break it down into pieces and you say, okay, well, what is my use case for the AI? What do I need it to do? And, you know, 
you have these LLMs that are that has a chorus of, of public data, publicly available data. Well, essentially what that is is scrubbing the internet, taking the entire internet and saying, we're going to feed it back to you in ways that make sense to you. But other sort of use cases, um, other sort of use cases require private infrastructure. So I think you're going to see that mirroring sort of the cloud infrastructure versus on-prem infrastructure discussion. Do I need it to be private? Do I need it to you know, be in a colo facility? Yeah, I, I think that's what we're seeing and we have this idea of a power law and that John, myself, and Dave Vellante and uh, George have worked on and I, I think part of what you see is, again, that the size of the models for those public ones that are scraping the internet and things like that are massive. And they're up kind of at the front and the top and then the power law comes and there's this long tail that's kind of being pulled upwards from a size perspective but the number of them and the specificity of them is very long. Like yeah. you have ones that are specific to telco, finance. Like for instance, I, I use the example of if I'm building 10Ks as the CFO, that would actually be a really good job for a LLM to go and do, is, or an SLM to go do very specifically, but I want to keep that data private because it's my financial data. Yeah. Do you, are you starting to see people engaging with you that says, hey, I'm looking for this compute for this and I need the security and the, the kind of you know, uh, walled garden as it would be. Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. I was on the phone with someone earlier today who was doing credit card fraud detection. That's why it kind of pops to mind, right? And his issue is, well, we need to keep this data absolutely private, absolutely secure. Can you imagine the implications of people's credit card information leaking out? I mean, yes you can because it's happened before, yeah. okay? But if AI gets a hold of it, it's a whole different you know, ball of wax. So there's absolutely the use case. And you know, I, I appreciate that article you did yeah. on the power law yeah. because it's a beautiful graph. It shows that the long tail of vertical specific AI, that's going to be, uh, that's going to translate into on-prem data centers. Yeah. Um, not, not everything is hosted, not everything is open. So we're going to have a mix and match of solutions that are necessary. You know, the way that we're looking at it is compute is compute. And when you have GPUs paired with CPUs, you're really going to need to get the most out of that platform. I got to ask you about data management. We got a couple minutes left. I want to understand the implications of how the data management market changes with this future. Um, data formats have been a big discussion. Proprietary formats, open formats, Databricks, they, um, you know, they introduced uh, concepts that were kind of mind-blowing, Rob. Remember, um, you got Iceberg and Parquet out there now. Um, data management clearly is changing. What's the impact um, and or order of magnitude importance of these formats? Can you scope that for us and how you see that? Sure. So. The, the proliferation of Iceberg and Parquet and the standardization on Iceberg and Parquet, um, it, you know, it's fantastic for data lakes and cloud data warehouses and everybody to kind of, and the Spark ecosystem in particular, Spark, Presto, and Trino. Um, but it's much more profound than formatting. And the way that we view this at Compute AI is for the first time in history, you're able to separate transactional workloads, so your typical DDL and DML, from queries, and queries are the ones that are taking up 80% of our compute requirements. So what we've done is we've built a query engine and- 80% is coming from the query side, you said? 80% of compute or more is coming from the query side. And this, this DQL, okay, by separating that, you can build a, a dramatically simplified engine that is focused on queries only. The time to market is fantastic, it's fast. Anybody can do this. What we bring to the table is to say, aha, now this is possible, we can build something that is far more efficient and utilizing the hardware resources that are already there that has never been done before. Joel, really appreciate you coming on theCUBE and again, sharing the vision. We love the, you know I love the URL, compute.ai. I think it's a great name, speaks for itself. I love the idea of compute as oxygen. Rob, you can't get enough bandwidth and you can't get enough compute and now right. GPUs. The world wants more power um, and more compute. So great job, great mission. For the last minute we have, put a quick commercial in for what you're doing, uh, your status as the company. Uh, are you looking for funding? Are you knocking on doors? Are you waiting? What's uh, for the people who are curious on how to engage with you, whether it's an investor, potential investor, or customer, 
Um, are you open for business? Give the quick pitch. Yeah, okay, so yes, we're open for the business. So I joined the company about five months ago. Before then, it was just the founding uh, team of engineers, so the four engineers. So only five of us in the company now, but we're gaining a lot of traction. We're uh, empowering channel partners right now. We're also speaking with customers and we're engaging with customers. Uh, the quick commercial on us is the compute efficiency that we're seeing we, we no longer require memory over provisioning. So we are dramatically shrinking the memory footprint that is required for compute. And when we do that, we balance this, the core to memory ratio, we run CPUs much higher efficiency, and we're getting a 10x performance improvement while reducing infrastructure at the same time as 5x. Uh, in terms of the stage of the company, we have early capital in, we're, I mean, my job, we're always raising capital. We're always in those conversations. And as I mentioned at the beginning, we're looking for those, uh, those partners to really share in the big vision. What kind us. of profile investor are you looking for? Uh, someone watching, is there a certain category or mindset or background affinity that you're looking for to have that match? Um, obviously you guys are, um, I won't say age out in terms of you guys are systems guys, never age out with systems. You're not the young 20 something year olds. I mean, Rob, we, you know, we started a company competing against 20 something year olds. This is the big challenge. What's going on? We're looking you for know? big thinkers. <laughs> We're looking for big visionaries who see the, same, the world the same way we do. This machine generated SQL is going to rule the world and we're providing the compute for that. Joel, great to see you and again. Congratulations on the venture. Love the idea, we'll be tracking it. Thanks for uh, sharing. Again, AI is just beginning. The picks and shovels, then it goes into mining, the data, uh, and again, compute will be a big part of it. Of course, the Cube bringing you all the compute action and content from KubeCon. We'll be back as we wrap up, start to wrap up day one. Stay with us, we'll be right back after this short break.